All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We are excited to welcome you all to today's History for Lunch presentation. Uh, as always, this is also being live streamed on Zoom. Uh, so for those of you all who are joining us virtually, we just ask to please mute your microphone and also use the chat uh, for your questions. Uh, we'll have time for all of our questions uh, virtual as well as in person at the end of the presentation. Now, just a reminder that the next History for Lunch is scheduled for Wednesday, February 1st at 12 p.m. Uh, documentarian Marvin Tupper Jones will describe the families of the United States Colored Troops in Northeastern North Carolina, along with their relatives' role in keeping the U.S. whole, expanding freedoms in America, and creating new opportunities for all people of color, whether free or enslaved. Uh, so be sure to join us for Mr. Jones's presentation on February 1st. Now, today we welcome Naval Architect Lou Codega, who will discuss the state of the art in small craft design and construction. Uh, Mr. Codega has worked in the small craft industry for almost 40 years, uh, where his recreational, commercial, and military designs have been built by some of the leading builders in this country and in Europe, and have also included all of regulator marine for the past 35 years. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Mr. Codega. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Noah. Uh, let me introduce a couple people first. Uh, Joan Maxwell is here. Is Joan? Joan is, and her husband Owen are the owners of Regulator Marine down in Edenton, and she's here with some of her crew. And it's, can, why don't I, 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 Eric Lee, uh, <laughs> Don, and Jonathan? Did, is there? Any, did anybody else sneak in? I think I've got them all. Um, I, I met them, as Noah said, about 35 years ago. And I, I gave them the worst sales pitch in the world and somehow they fell for it. <laughs> we, we, but as, as Noah said, we've been working together for uh, all their, you know, basically the whole entire uh, time the regulator's been in business. And I, it's probably the longest running business relationship in, in, in the business. I'm not, I'm not quite sure, but it, it probably is. Uh, I'm, I'm a classically trained naval architect. So I've got degrees from MIT and, and Webb Institute Naval Architecture, which when I started this business was really unusual. Most of the people uh, probably didn't have degrees or maybe they had mechanical engineering degrees or you know something like that. Uh, fortunately, it's becoming a lot more common and prevalent these days. Um, I've done about 75 individual designs that have been built. And I guess we're, how many boats have you built, John? Uh, over 5,000. Yeah, so I'm, I'm probably at about 6,000 boats altogether between Regulator and, and everybody else. Um, I've always had a small staff. It's mostly just been me and you know one, one sometimes two other people. So I, I've designed all the boats myself. Uh, it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's a, you know, it's, it's a great gig. I'm happy to have pulled it off. <laughs> uh, I really, I mean, I, I know this stuff, so I, I want to make this enjoyable and, and a good experience for you. So ask me questions, interrupt me. If you see something you want me to talk about, uh, just you know, raise your hand. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to, to deal with the, the questions online at this point. Let's save them to the end. But um, you know, as, as I say, any, any, anything within the range of boat design and construction, feel free. The only thing I don't want to hear about is my boat's broke. How do I fix it? <laughs> no, no one, no one really wants to hear that. Okay, uh, let me let me start off just by scrolling through some of the boats that I've done. This is the Regulator uh, Twenty Five, I think. Um, a little small sport fishing boat. I've done some larger crew boats. This is a, a N thirteen. Um, this is its larger sister, which is a 47 foot boat. These are all, so far all fiberglass boats that I'm showing you. This, this is a boat that one of my Italian clients built, uh, a company named Blue Gang, which are really very innovative um, and very, very interesting boats. Some, something, a style of boat that we don't see here much in the United States. I've done a lot of military stuff. This is actually a prototype of a uh, riverine patrol boat. And it, it's, it's kind of interesting for the, for the design geeks here. It's all cord carbon fiber laminates and there's no structure on the inside except for about three bulkheads. 
So there's no stringers, there's no, uh, no interior structure. It's basically entirely supported by the hull, which is kind, kind of, yeah, it's kind, it's kind of unique. And the, the interesting thing about that was that th these boats run over rocks, they run over, you know, logs, all, all kinds of things. And they da that damages the boat. So the thinking was, well, if, if we have a very soft, flexible bottom that will just give, we won't cause any damage. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. Um, we, we, I mean, I, I think that's actually me on the boat. Uh, we, we ran over scuba bottles that were sticking six inches up out of the water at about 50 knots and didn't do any, just, you know, basically scraped the bottom of the boat. It's really, really pretty cool. I, I wish I could claim credit for the structure, but I, I can't, but <laughs> I did the rest of it. Uh, I've also done a number of aluminum boats. This is a uh, aluminum water jet police boat. That I, my memory is that it, it, it's a, in Perth Amboy. It was, it was sent to the Perth Amboy Police Department. This was a project that I did when I was working with Don Blunt, and this is a, a ship really called Destriero that was built to basically challenge the uh, transatlantic speed records. And this boat crossed from New York to, uh, I think it's Land's End in England. I'm not sure where the where the end point is. I can't recall the end point, but you know, basically in 53 hours, it, it averaged over 53 knots all the way across the Atlantic. Um, I wanted to spend a couple minutes talking about there's there's not very much history going to be talked about here, so I wanted to spend a couple minutes talking about how, how my work has changed. And this is the the very, this is Regulator Twenty Six. I think that's Joan. Is that correct? I think, <laughs> and Owen uh, in Oregon Inlet. And this is not the first one, but this was my first first recreational design. And this is my latest launch, which is a 55 foot boat. And they, they kind of look the same. In, it, one's obviously one's bigger than the other, but you know, there, there's a, a, a resemblance there. The design process was totally different. The, the regulator was done with hand drawings, uh, mostly hand calculations. I had a computer at the time, but it was, you know, uh, you know, the little floppy disk drive kind of, kind of deal. Bare, barely functional, uh, you know, it could do spreadsheets. That's about it. This one was done totally on, I, I don't think I have a piece of paper on the boat at all. It was all done uh, with computer aided design, um, 3D drafting. I've, I've got some slides of it further on down the road. Uh, CFD calculations, we did some model tests, to to totally different process, even though the result looks pretty much the same. Um, it, here's some of the 3D graphics that are involved. Obviously, this, this is all done on the computer. And the, the interesting thing is that it, it takes about the same amount of time for me to do it on the computer than, than it used to do by hand. I don't really save any time myself, but it saves a lot of time downstream uh, that we've, you know, eliminated five or six steps in, in the design and build process by, by doing this. This goes directly, these files go directly, you know, basically from my computer to a computer at the builder's office. And, you know, some, some period of time later, the product comes out. It, so if, some of you, if some of you folks know traditional, you know, boat or shipbuilding, in the old days, I would the naval architect would do drawings, you know, maybe four or five feet long. They would be sent to the yard. There would be a loftsman who would take those drawings and expand them to full size, correct all the the discrepancies and the error, not so much the errors, but the the inaccuracies in my drawing. And then they would start making patterns from that. And you know, months and months later, they actually would start building something. And we really, you know, really very much cut to the chase here. Uh, again, just, you know, some more details of, of the 3D design. But, you know, basically I'm building the boat electronically. We can look inside the boat. Uh, you know, again, the, the, the graphics are cool, but this also helps the build process. A view from the top looking down inside 
And the, inter the interesting thing is that this, this runs on a home computer. You know, I, 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 whenever I have to buy a computer, I go out and buy the best gaming computer I can find, but this, you know, it's not really something special. Uh, it, it, the, the gaming computer has the graphics built into it that allows all this to work pretty much seamlessly. <clears throat> And then this is, um, I forgot what regulator this is. I think this is a 34, but you know, again, just to show you a little bit of the process on a, on a different boat. These are all the individual parts that these guys put together to, to build a boat. So here's a hull, and then here's our, our the structural grillage that goes inside of it. And the, the deck cap goes in, sort of an exploded view of the boat, which we hope in, never, in real life, no one ever sees. And then the, from a marketing standpoint or advertising standpoint, things like this come out of the, 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 my 3D graphics. So you, you don't have to wait for the boat to show up to start advertising. It, this could be advertised you know, months, before, months before the boat's ready, which is important because the magazines typically run five or six or seven months out. So it helps to have, if, if, you're, wait, if you're waiting for, take a picture of a boat, the boat's already been on the water for six or eight months before the magazine can see it. <laughs> this, is, this is an integrating planimeter, and I, I actually have worked one of these things in college. Uh, it, 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 it takes two people 40 hours to do a set of calculations now that I can literally click a button on my computer and have two seconds later. Uh, many, many long nights were spent <laughs> When, when, when the birds start tweeting in the morning, you know you've wasted, wasted your evening. But the, the reason we, we do all kinds of calculations, you know, the, the boat, the boat is, is a lot more than just graphics. It's, there's, we have structural calculations, stability calculations, um, systems, you know, pre pressure drop calculations. Is that engine going to get enough water? Is it going to get enough air? Uh, you know, probably. 50 or 60 different sets of calculations to go into the picture or go, go into what you guys see as a pretty picture or a nice boat at a boat show. Um, here, here's some bad examples. This is a boat that was launched. This was as it was being launched. And it, the, the, the next picture is it rolling on its side. Uh, here's, here, here's a sailboat, but uh, bro broken in two. And in in, um, in 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 the designer's defense, my one of my classmates was responsible for the design of this boat, and uh, it was bleeding edge technology. It was a, a carbon fiber boat when no one really knew how to handle and work with carbon fiber, and it was a risk. And they knew they were taking it, and it, it didn't quite work out. But you know, stuff like that happens, it, and it's not a production boat. You know, obviously that was an America's Cup boat. I don't know the background behind this picture, but this is this is what we really try hard to avoid when we do transom calculations. And I, again, I don't, you know, again, just to, I'm not sure we can blame the design for this. What I have done on a couple projects, if if it's really worthwhile, is to do CFD calculations, and this is a, a way of actually calculating the water pressure on the bottom of the boat. And it's a terrifically difficult problem. It's much more difficult than um, the aerospace problem, if you will, because there's a free surface. Part of the boat's running in water, part of it's running in air. The part that's in the water is the important part and that part is changing all the time. So ever since I've been in school, they've been telling us that CFD is gonna be taken over in, in the next 10 years. And that's been almost 50 years at this point, but it is getting better and better. And it, it's very good for, for um, calm water, what we call calm water calculations. Uh, the, the rough water stuff is really beyond it right now. Here's the bo bottom pressures on a step bottom boat where, the, where you see red, the pressure is high. When you see blue is actually in the air. So again, you know. Uh, hey, Lou, tell us what CFD stands for. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, computer fluid dynamic calculations, CFD. So yeah, obviously, I, I'm, I'm, that's kind of a vital point. Thanks, Don. Uh, this is obviously all done in, in supercomputers. I mean, literally supercomputers. It takes 
hours and hours and days and days to do this sort of thing. Yeah, well, not, you know, the, 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 the calm water stuff is getting better, Don, in, in that it's, you know, in the minutes at this point. Okay. But I, I, have, I have a client that plays around with, with rough water calculations and he'll run, he has, you know, basically a homemade computer that's, you know, I think he described it as basically a hundred desktop computers that run for three or four days that reproduces about seven seconds of actual boat running through the water. So, it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a uh, party trick. It, it really is of no value at all from a design standpoint. Um, it's really good for things like this. This is a flow around propellers and rudders. Um, weird stuff happens when you make when you ask water to bend and this is a good way to make sure that you know for example you're not getting air or cavitation in your propellers another you know another detail around the strut and the you know diff different colors represent the different water pressures occasionally we do model test programs i've, I've done a few in my career three or four this is this is the, the 55 foot boat that I was showing you the pictures of earlier, which was very high speed boat. It, it was beyond what anybody else had ever done. So we said, oh, maybe you know, maybe it's time to do some model tests just to see. It, it was beyond my beyond the range of my calculations. So the model tests helped me validate that what I thought was going to happen really was going to happen. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's kind of interesting. The model test program probably added less than 1% to the cost of the program. And it's for stuff like this, it's really worth it. If anybody goes to a company like Regulator and says they need to do model tests, you need to find a new model architect. Because that's, that's really, you know, that's within the range of what you should know. This is beyond, you know, beyond the state of the art. And it lets you do stuff like this. This is a picture of that same boat looking up from the bottom. And the interesting thing here is you can you can see a streak of air coming off the strake, which it, which is really kind of common. It always does, but in this case, it goes right into the tunnel. So we when we the thing we learned here is we got rid of that strake when we went to build the boat. And let me let me see if I can make this work. If, let me see. No. Nope. No, is, do, do you have some secret way to make to uh, run this clip? This is worth a little bit of a, a delay to see if we can make this happen. Perfect. And there's going to be another one too. So, yeah. okay. This is that boat running in calm water. So this represents the full scale boat running at 55 knots. Can, can you run that again? So we'll do it. We'll do it again. This, this was all done at the lab at, up at Stevens, Stevens Institute. So that's the model itself was about this big, I think. So it's pretty cool. And then there's one on the next slide as well, please. And then we also can do rough water tests. You know, I, I was just saying how bad or how inefficient the uh, CFD is for rough water. We, we can do do it in the model test. And this is this is the boat running at uh, 25 knots in a sea state two, which is about a four and a half or a five foot sea. Yeah. So anyway, and could, why don't you run that again? Because that's, that's probably the coolest thing we're going to see. But you, the, boat, the boat is instrumented, so we can measure the motions, which are really not all that important. But what is important is we can measure the accelerations. And then once we have the acceleration, the, the, we can do the structures. We know, we know what everything's going to has to withstand. And this boat was designed for about five Gs. So that's, you know, I think a, a fighter airplane is designed for nine. Um, the, this was designed for five. Um, that's a lot. I've I've been in boats that are running four Gs, and and four Gs will knock you to your feet. Um, I've I've been in a boat that was running about three Gs, and and a guy who didn't know what he was doing broke his leg. 
because he was he wasn't writing properly. Okay, perfect. Was it fifty? Was the end result fifty-two thousand pounds displacement? We were a little bit that. That's at the high. We we tested over a range, Don, and I I think we came in at about forty-eight thousand, forty-seven thousand full load, and we um we were just the the owner asked for. Fifty-two and a half knots, and we said we we promised him fifty. We gave him 49, 50, 54.9. So I, I I don't know of any boat like that that's running at that speed. Okay, I think we're that's good. Thank you. So as I said, I'm not, I'm not aware of any 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 propeller driven you know shaft driven conventionally driven boat that runs that fast all the time i mean the guy the guy the owner the owner's a real nice guy he said i, I can go out and run 54 anytime i want it it's great and he he cruises it at 45 so yeah and that's which is you know beyond the range of almost everybody at that size okay um we're doing good here quick tour through production boat building this is actually regulator marine pictures the whole mold um yeah, I've, <laughs> does anybody have any understanding of how how a fiberglass boat is built okay you start with the mold the materials come in basically on on a roll of fabric and a drum of liquid and the workers combine those two and catalyze the resin and it makes it hard so yeah, and that's kind of the basic explanation. So when, when you go to a boat show, that stuff that you're seeing, you know, the hard fiberglass, this is obviously wood, but the fiberglass started off in that shop as fabric and resin, and it gets built in a mold. Here, here's a, some of the parts being laminated. Uh, that part you just saw being put into the part you saw on the slide before, this is the grillage going into the hull. Some people walk through the assembly shop. This is going to be the cockpit liner. Um, with, I think at this point pieces are being installed into it. You can you can see some hardware sticking through. I think those are uh, cup cup holders and you know there's wires and things. That piece completed being put into the hull. And these are all different boats. So I'm I'm kind of confusing you, but the idea is is the same. And you notice that the, the part going in the the the, cog, the the ring deck has all the pieces attached to it already so it's it's kind of like it, it's nowhere near as automated as an automobile production line but the idea is you try to do as much as you can away from the main assembly line if you will and put as completed as possible pieces together as as the boat is is, is worked on there's another view of, you know, basically, I think probably taken at the same time on the same boat from different angles. Um, I'm going to have a little bit more of this later, but some pieces are done with resin transfer. And that, that's actually in, in variations on the theme, if you will, is, is sort of the coming way of doing things. It, it cuts down on styrene emissions. It gives you a better, more consistent product. And re regulator uses it for small parts. So that basically two molds go together, fabric, the fabric is put in the middle, and then resin is let into one end and sucked out the other. And that's a very gross simplification. But the idea is that what starts off as dry laminate gets laminated with a fixed amount of resin in a fixed clamped mold. And when it comes out, it's finished on two sides, which is you know kind of cool. So the resin goes goes in one side. Of, you know, they draw a vacuum on the other, which you know pulls the resin through, and it comes out more or less finished. Just you know the, some some work around the edges, little regulator sticker in a couple of places where there's a little blemish, and no one knows the difference. <laughs> don't tell the secrets right <laughs> okay some some pictures of, of boats rolling down the assembly line you see more and more completion as we go along parts parts are being installed 
uh, engines are going in. That's well, those they don't make those engines anymore, but that's what fifty thousand dollars, sixty thousand dollars worth of engines sitting there. Um, again, more more and more complete as it goes down the goes down the production line. A view from outside of Don's office, looking looking down in, into the into the assembly area. You see part, you know, the closer to your left, the boats are more finished, and, and closer to me is are, are somewhat less finished. Uh, nearly, uh, probably a completed boat looks like it's getting just about getting ready for its final inspection. And again, you know, this is pretty much what you see when you go to the boat shows. Um, let's talk about custom building, which shares a lot, except that we don't have the molds. So basically, you have to find a way to, to take this fabric and take this resin and build it out over nothing. So the, the way that's usually done, there's, there's a number of ways to do it, but what I'm going to show you is a, is a um, I don't know, it's not, it's not the 55, but it's a smaller sister to that 55, and, and that being built over over a jig. So you start off with a hull jig and they, they erect frames. Now, again, the, these come from me to the boat yard. Th this particular boat yard has a, has a five axis router. So they cut them there themselves and assemble them. So that, you know, there's no, no lofting involved. I basically design it at full size. They cut it and install it, and you, you can't you can't see it the, this angle and this level of detail. But I've got uh, witness marks in there. The water lines are marked. There's holes for lasers, so they can start at one end of the boat and shoot a laser through all those frames. And if it comes through at the other end, they know they've got everything aligned. So a lot a lot of a lot of details can be worked into there that are not really obvious to you when you're looking at them. Is another view. If, the people in the front row probably can see those witness marks, the horizontal lines as we go up. And then uh, the, this, I, I'm not, I don't know if anybody else is doing this. This, this. this is pretty cool and it's a result of them, the yard having their own five axis router is where we transition from cord laminates to single skin laminates. We, we design these blockers so that the core comes up to the edge of the, of the we're, we're calling them blockers, but they're not blockers in, in, in the sense I just know, know what a blocker is. Uh, the, the core comes up to them. And then when they laminate outside skin, they'll put some mold re, or some uh, mold release or you know, uh, PVA or something on that piece that you see so they can laminate over the whole thing and have a cord laminate and a single skin laminate coming off the same jig. And yeah, again, I we we kind of thought came up with that ourselves, and other people may use it. But the thing that makes it work again is that they have a, a five-axis router that can cut these pieces in the next bay over from where this is going. There's a piece at the bottom, so the the, the bottom core is being put in place. Uh, you can see we, it's going to be a single screw tunnel boat, so there we have a, the blocker for that section of the boat. Half of it's done. We're again, we, where the bow thruster is going to be. We've got a, a single skin area, so we have the you know again uh, we're calling blockers. They're not, but that will be laminated single skin at the same time. This is view from the bow. This this actually was taken last Friday, and they th there's an old boat building tree. We have we have to get a little bit of history in within this lecture, right? There's an old boat building tradition when you when you put the last plank on a traditionally frame traditionally plank wooden boat. It's called the whiskey plank or the shutter plank, and very often it's on the keel, so it's the most difficult plank to get in because it's odd shaped and it's twisting and it, it's it's just just a pain. So the, the old boat building tradition is when you put the last plank in, it's called the whiskey plank. And everybody pauses and has a party for the rest of the day. So, so um, with whiskey, obviously, <laughs> or at least, at least if you're in Scotland, I guess. Anyway, last last Friday they put last piece of the of the plank. It's not this is foam core. It's not traditional wood planking. 
but they put the very last piece, which was down in this corner in, and they invited the, the, the man on the left is furthest left in that row is the owner. So they invited him in and he and I don't know who those other guys are, but they, they had a little you know ceremony of setting the whiskey plank. And it, it was easy to do. It's actually the easiest one on the boat. But, you know, an excuse for a party is an excuse for a party. And there we go. Um, this is the 55, which is built as a, a custom boat again, but it was built a little bit differently. And this actually was built in a mold um, because we had some real high tech laminates on here. And what we used was a resin that was heat curing. So we, the yard was able to laminate the boat and the resin doesn't cure until you put it into an oven and, and bake it. So what's going on here is probably the first lamp, it's either the outer skin or the core is getting ready to be vacuum bagged and play in preparation for going in the oven. And basically what they did was when they needed the oven, they would build a, uh, uh, they, they would go to buy every piece of foam from every Lowe's in, in the area and, you know, kind of make their own oven and have propane heaters. And I, if anybody besides the regular people know, the, the heat release is very important. So it had to be monitored and heat goes up, heat goes down. And it had to be kept within a very narrow range, about 20, 20 degrees, I think it was like 120 to 140 for about 10 hours to cure the resin. And it, it lets you get a real very, very high quality, um, very strong, very light laminates. That, and, that's, and that's how we, the, the structure on this boat was 10,000 pounds, everything, hull, deck, everything you call structure. And that's about what you guys build for a 41. And this is, you know, the, the vacuum bag going in. So what, what happens here is that the blue, the blue, is essentially a bag, the blue material is essentially a bag, you draw a vacuum on it, and you use atmospheric pressure to, to push everything and compact the laminates. This is the, the outside core, it's all carbon skins of that same boat. Uh, some pictures looking into the transom, again, it was all, 95% was all carbon, carbon fiber core laminates. An engine going in, that's a, 1900 horsepower engine you can you know that, that's not a small guy standing in front of it and it had two of them right and it had two of them yeah yeah it's a 1900 horsepower that the the washing machine is a is a is a flexible coupling connecting the engine to the engine to the gear again you know it's kind of in the same in the same view of walking down the production line there's only one of them things are bigger they happen a lot more slowly Beautiful, beautiful cabinet work going into the boat. Um, you know, kind of, um, I, I, you know, the, the, the finest house you've ever seen level of, of cabinet work. A, a settee. And these are pretty, kind of quite almost nearly finished at this point. Some interior shots. That's a, apparently the, the owner found that copper countertop and apparently it, he found it on an old Rybovich or something. I didn't. I didn't get the whole story, but it's a beautiful, old vintage copper uh, sink and countertop. And you know I, I, that the teak is not a traditional teak deck. That's actually a uh, like a, a. It's it is wood, but it is it's built in Florida on on sheets. That again, from my design process, I send them the outline of the teak, and they. They cut it there, it gets shipped to Maryland and gets installed. And this is pretty much finished. Two engines, generator on one side. Underneath the teak grate is a, a gyro stabilizer. Some interior pieces, all you know, custom leather um, furniture. They, ma many cows gave their lives for that, for that <laughs> leather work. It's, it's really amazing quality. And well, we're doing pretty good here. So aluminum, again, sort of the same, somewhat different. Um, when we do aluminum boats, um, I, again, I, I will design the whole the whole boat, every every stupid piece on the boat, 
and there's you know maybe a bow like this might have 1500 pieces so it's kind of like designing this massive erector set and as an example here is a hull for i don't think the boat we just saw but a similar boat and i can get that and explode it into individual sheets of aluminum that may, you know, maybe may have different thicknesses. It, it wouldn't be unusual for the bottom to be one thickness and the side to be the other. And then we can get those and lay them out flat and then turn them into cut files. So this would go from my office to the guy who has the router that, that will cut these pieces. And it, it turns into a giant erector set essentially, or it's all welded, obviously, you know, don't have a little silly screws that you lose, but it's, it, you know, it's all welded, you know, welded construction. And I, I put along, along with the cut files, I give them, and this, this is a very simple example, but a set of instructions. And when we, when my guides and I do it, it say, okay, this is an Ikea instruction book on how to assemble the boat. And it's literally step by step by step. And the, the pieces are all numbered. The pieces all have alignments. And I'll, I'll give them a, um, maybe for a hull, maybe a, a 20 page document that is, okay, you know, here's how you set up the strong back. Here's how you start the, this is where the frames go. This is where these two pieces come together, you know, take, find this part number, put it on that part number, align it with the line that I've, I've put on the part. So it's very, you know, it's hugely tedious, but it saves so much down the, on the construction end. So here's an aluminum boat being put together. It, you know, you can see the similarities with the, the wooden boat or the, uh, the custom fiberglass boat that I just showed you a few minutes ago. The difference is that the, this is going to be a structure inside of the boat that the, the one off is, is at least the way that is built is, is sacrificial. The planking going in or bot, you know, bottom plating rather. Some interior pieces. Again, you know, again on the interior. And as I say, one a 40 foot boat might be literally 1500 pieces that I, that I would supply. And you know you just break it down into little bits and work on it at a time. And this is essentially the same technology that they use in, they use at Newport News Shipyard when when they're when they're building an aircraft carrier. It's just as two of us doing it instead of <laughs> 10, 2,000 or however many. Some pictures on the interior. Again, um, I think this is a base for a water jet, if I remember correctly. And Looks like the aluminum work is just about finished here. This is the waste boat that I showed you the finished picture of a little while ago getting put together. And there, you know, I, this is probably about ready for launch. And this is the, the fire boat that I showed you the graphic for before. And I think um, I got two, two pictures of the police boat. It did float. So that's a good, that's a good <laughs> sign. Um, now we, we've got some options it's 120 or i'm sorry it's 12 it's 12 12 40 20 minutes to one i can answer questions i can talk about tooling we can talk about something that sparked your interest as i was talking or whatever you want to do yes sir All those interior cross members, they, they come out? They yes. Fiberglass. Yes. What is cold molding? Uh, cold, cold molding is a wooden, is a construction technique for wooden boats. And it's superficially similar to what I showed you here for the, the custom fiberglass boat. Um, cold molding would, would have a jig set up just like we had here some of those pieces in the jig might stay with the boat. So some of those, some of those pieces may be 
rather than sacrificial plywood may actually be bulkheads that are going to stay in those. And it, as I say, it's a wooden construction technique. So this is, this is what the guys in Wan Chi's do, for example. They will use relatively thin strips of wood and laminate over those frames, much, much in the same way they were putting the, the core in place. But typically what they would do, you know, the, the wood becomes the structure. So typically, and, and wood is also more difficult to work with than that foam. So it'd be thinner strips and probably narrower strips that would get laid in, in maybe three layers, four layers, depending on the size of the boat. And they would often be, um, this, usually it would be done in, in diagonal layers, one a layer like this, one layer like this, one layer along the length of the boat, and sometimes two layers along the length in inside and outside, depends on how big the boat is and how much stretch you need. And those will all be glued together. So that becomes a, that, that becomes the hull of the boat. And, and usually again, in, in, in these days, that would be covered with a relatively light coat of um, a, a glass reinforcement of some sort, you know, set in epoxy. So it's, again, it's a, it's a, it's a coal molding specifically is a wooden boat construction, but there would be, I don't have any pictures of, but if I did, you would see a lot of resemblance to other things we've seen here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I had, I, that's why I make the big bucks. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, it's, is there a no, no, there's, there's no other balance, but you balance it out with the other stuff in the boat, if you will. So, um, you, you know, you, you're, you're exactly right. Your, your thinking is exactly right. Is that for any boat, there's, you know, you, you want the center of gravity to be in within a very narrow range. And when you, you put engines on the back, you have to move other stuff forward to get that center of gravity of the, of the total, if you will, in the right spot. Now, where, where, you, where you get into trouble is when you start off with two engines and you get a call and say, hey, we want to put on three. Who would do that? No one. No one does that. Yeah. So, you know, so then, then you have to start scrambling. So, okay, well, you know, what, what can I move? Is there, you know, is there anything that can be shifted? Do we just live with it? You know, that becomes difficult. As, as the original design problem, it's really no big deal. I mean, you know, it's, it's another one of the dozen things or two dozen things that have to be worked out. After the fact, it becomes difficult. And the, the, re the reason they have three is because four doesn't fit. <laughs> and they have, if they have four, it's because five didn't fit, you know, and that, I mean, it, it's absolutely crazy, but that's kind of the, the way the market is right now. What's the mold made out of? The mold's made out of fiberglass as well. That's a, that's, that's a really good question. It, it's, it's made out of fiberglass. It's, it's actually made very similar to the boat itself. Um, uh, it's made very similar to the boat. It's usually thicker. Um, and you, you saw the, that framing on the earlier pictures of the mold, and that's to hold it in shape. You know, you, you don't want, the, the, the hull itself is actually, when, when, you, when you pull one of these boats out of the mold, it, it's surprisingly flexible. And it, it becomes stiff when you put all the pieces together. It becomes, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, putting, putting the, the, uh, the lid on a shoe box, if you will. <clears throat> All the pieces together become very strong, but individually the pieces are very floppy. So the, the steel around the mold, it, it holds it in shape so that every part that you take out of it has the, the shape you want. But, but it, again, it's, you know, it's, it's, to really answer your question, it, it's similar to the mold to a hull. It's, it's usually thicker. It's always thicker um, because you, you Molds live a hard life and you want it thicker and it also has to absorb heat from, from the uh, chemical reaction as, the, as the, 
the resin cures. So you, it, it acts as sort of like a, you know, a heat sink in your computer where it pull, pulls heat away from the hull or the part. How does it not stick? Uh, well, I guess, yeah, it's another good question. It gets waxed. They, they put, these guys are, the, the people who work for these guys put a layer of wax in between and pretty much every, you guys wax after every part, every few parts and, you know, and, th and that, that the, the resin doesn't stick to the wax. Now, sometimes it does, you know, <laughs> sometimes it does very often, not often, but sometimes you'll get little pieces that have stuck and it's, you know, broken when, when they take the hull out or whatever part, it'll take a little bit of the mold with it and they can go back and, and fix that. But this, a story I heard, and I don't know if it's true or not, is that the very first boat that was built in fiberglass, they, they didn't realize that, you know, they, they made a mold and then they laminated the boat inside and they, they didn't know about wax. So, so they couldn't get it apart. And the rumor is it's in, it's in Bristol Harbor up in Rhode Island, sitting in the bottom someplace still. <laughs> but again, I, I wasn't there, so I don't know if that's true or not. Anything else? You want me to carry on with some very old pictures of tooling? <laughs> this, this, is a, this is a trip down memory lane for, uh, for Joan. Uh, th this, is, this is the regulator 20. This, uh, again, as I was saying when we started, uh, my, what I do has changed, although the result looks the same. And the tooling process has changed, although, again, the results look the same. Th this is the regulator 26 being tooled in like, was the old A&P in Edenton. Um, do I have that picture here? Yeah, we go. The, the, <laughs> I was hoping Owen was here. The, the, low, the low overhead operation. Um, <laughs> and back, back in the days when we were skinny and our hair was brown, and, you know, that's 30, 35 years, 34 years ago now. Um, this, this is a hull being built, being tooled to, to, to go back to your coal molding question. This would look very similar to a coal molded boat being built. And this, this was in the day when it, molds were made for, you know, molds were made kind of like a, a boat, like a wooden boat. Um, it took a, a real good number of very highly skilled boat builders, like pattern makers, if you will, if you're you know, familiar with machine work. These guys really knew what they were doing. And they would work to very tight tolerances um, to, you know, take my drawing and turn it into a boat. Another picture of the same, the same boat replaced by this, by the robot, you know, like, like so much in the world. And what, what happens here is that this is a, uh, what we call a five axis mill that basically can machine a ball sitting in the air. It can, you know, go, go work its way around to do basically any shape you want, uh, cutting a hull plug for the same boat, you know, a similar boat like we just saw. These are, these are all regulators and I've, I've lost track of which one is which. But, you know, again, all those really skilled guys who were making the wooden plugs are gone, replaced basically by me on one end and a, and a machine on the other and a, a guy running the machine. So that's, you know, the way of the world, but it's too bad. Further down into the plug construction, uh, another plug being built. Some details, and um, again, these are these are the boats, if you will, or they're boat shaped that will be turned into molds. And it, the, the you see the five axis machine running around, doing its thing. The um, <laughs> this, this is an interesting story. The, this is this is the five axis machine at the yard that built my fifty five, and. The Statue of Columbus in Baltimore Harbor got rolled into the river. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm probably related to Columbus somehow, so I, th I think he's getting a bad rap, but, but anyway, some, somebody got the statue and, and picked it up off its plinth and, and tossed it into Baltimore Harbor where it was recovered. So the yard 
got a contract basically to reproduce it. And what they did was they, they took the pieces of the statue that existed, patched them back together, did a 3D scan, and then cut it up into mathematically cut the statue into pieces that they could machine. And this is this is Columbus's head being machined. And the, the reason I have it here is it, it gives you an idea of the intricacy of what can be done with that five axis router. And then that's the, the, the guy the guy who did it and, and my, my long lost cousin, Christopher. Um, but I mean, you know, it's pretty major. So I, I, I don't know if they're putting it back where it was, but I'm not, I'm not sure what's going to happen to it. But the sculptor is going to take this and then cast a new bronze one that will be will be put someplace. So again, instead of the sculptor doing this in plaster or whatever, you know, whatever he did, it's, you know, a couple, couple of smart guys in the machine. But, it, you know, again, it's a copy of a copy of, um, you know, a copy of an original. It's, it's not original work in any way, shape or form. Here's some molds and go back to your question. You can see some of these braces that we have here holding the mold so it's nice and stiff. And this also lets the mold roll so that people can work on the inside. And now I'm really out of stuff. So <laughs> I, I don't sing, I don't dance. So we've got about, we've got a few minutes left for questions if anybody has any. Yes, sir. I have, yeah, um, this, this, is, uh, this is kind of a historical question, but um, I was thinking about, you know, for, for centuries there have been, you know, large ships, you know, especially, you know, wooden ships going out on the sea. But mm -hmm. I mean, around what time did people shift from just kind of trying different things to see what worked and, you know, to using mathematical precision to, to figure it out? Well, I said, yeah, that's an interesting question because, um, yeah, it's an interesting question and actually one that sort of has an answer. And it's in the 1800s. 1800s. Yeah, there was at at the time in the eight. Well, the, it it also went along. This light is right in my eye, so I'm going to move. Um, it also went along with a shift in technology, because in in the late 1800s, people had, as you say, people had been wooden ships, kind of experimenting, seeing what worked, seeing what different work, what didn't work, and and building on it. In the 1800s with, with the industrial age was a sea change in the business. And we, people started transitioning from wood to, to iron and then from iron you know, to steel, uh, riveted construction, power, power driven ships, originally you know, steam, reciprocating steam, paddle wheels. Uh, it, it was a huge, uh, um, huge shift in the technology and in, in, in kind of an, a real interesting sidebar is I went to a school named called Webb Institute Naval Architecture it was founded by a shipbuilder named William Webb and it was specifically founded because he's he, he had been taught under the apprenticeship apprenticeship system by his father and he realized that that was not going to work anymore in the late 1800s, the, you know, the, 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 built, the world had changed and a lot of this technology was coming out of England in particular, but generally because of, of the industrial age that was going on. So William Webb in 1888 founded Webb Institute, at that time was called Webb Academy, but founded the school specifically to teach kids like me 50 years ago, 45 years ago, the science and the engineering and, and the math and the, you know, the naval architecture, um and the structures that they were they were going to need going forward so that that really was you know the first school of naval architecture in the united states still you know still still alive and kicking um but similar you know similar things were happening in europe and france at the same time in germany yeah so that's kind of a fun question anybody else yes sir? once you get a mold just like you like it yeah. You're building the ship just like you want it. How yep. many can you make out of the same mold? Well, it depends how depends how well you take care of the mold. What do you what do you you guys somebody there answer, Don? We got uh, 28, I think, is over 600 and counting right now. Yeah. Mold mold. Once you get once you get a mold like you want it, 
You're downtown, right? Well, you have to maintain it. Right. Yeah, the, you know, there's what what's your maintenance cycle on a on a mold? Well, there's a long cycle. About every about every three to four weeks, and we'll pull we'll pull a particular model out of the schedule, and it's down for a week so that we can get hands on it and touch up. And, yeah. Um, strip it down, um, put new uh, mold release agents on it, and so forth. Yeah. So it goes on for a long time, but a lot of that is the care, you know, the care that these guys put into it. It's obviously, it's a huge investment. And it's not building too many parts too fast, or, so we want to cool the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. In your um, 30 plus years experience, have you seen very many um, times when the common knowledge and even the common design methods weren't adequate to actually describe what was actually happening or you said like it has to be like rough water is very hard to quantify. Yeah. Um, for instance, I've heard lots of people talk for a long time about uh, efficiency for color versus heat, but then we have surface problems and then we have water half the time. Yeah. So, like, have you seen very many times when design philosophy, um, like a few changes of design philosophy? Yeah. So that's, the, the technology is always changing, um, but it's been more or less incremental. Uh, it, it, it's kind of interesting, like, uh, if, if you look at a lot of this stuff, some of this stuff that's happening now from a historical perspective, it really been around for 100 years. But for whatever reason, you know, the technology now or the, or the something now allows it to be built. And for example, step, step bottom holds. Everybody, you know, if, if, if you walk down to a dock, somebody would probably tell you that, you know, oh, this is something brand new, you know, latest technology. Well, the fact of the matter is the first patent on a stepped hull was I think in 1910 or 1915, but they were hard to build and, you know, the boats weren't fast enough. You know, there was, there was something else that allowed that technology to become uh, important or you know viable, I guess is maybe the answer. Um, it, it's I would say mostly it's been incremental, and you know, we've seen huge huge incremental changes in structures, in, especially in, in the composite field. Um, and engines are always getting lighter and, and more powerful, but it, I don't know. I, I can't. I, 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 I have I have not really seen anything that say, oh, now we have to go back to the drawing board and start over. Yeah. Okay. Anybody? Oh yeah. Yes, sir. This, this might be one for regular individuals. Well, how long does it take to um, concept that I want to have a six foot regulator to design it and make the first one? Um, well, I can answer part of that question. Uh, working the way I do, it's the design is about a four month process for, you know, for a 36 foot boat. It doesn't, it doesn't change too much, whether it's a 21 or a 41, you know, it's a, the computer doesn't care whether, how long something is to I have to go through the same process. So it's three, three or four months and we're, you know, ready to, ready to send models to the tooling shop um it's kind of depend where you hit them in their process right it could be what six eight months yeah, it depends the tooling leads and, and uh, we get tools and well right now we, we turn loose with the design Probably what was it in? It was a break, right? Yeah, it was. It was about a year ago. Yeah, last December. We sit, but we then we take it in house and we do iterations as far as offsets and manufacturability. We sent the stuff to the tooler. Um, we sent it right around break this year, and we're building number one right now. Yeah. So yeah, July, and now we're building the first. We're almost done with the first. 
Um, yeah. But that was actually longer than normal for the tooling company because they, there's been a flood of manufacturers wanting to build new boats just because of the market wind. So, yeah, and yeah. they had a hurricane, um, yeah. which kind of stalled us out a little yeah. bit. But yeah. it's usually, you know, we can get a tool in three, three months. Yeah. And, and, so, and some of the bigger boat companies have all of these functions in house. I mean, I'm in house, the tooling shop is in house. And they probably can go six months, yeah. you know, from from the time the, the marketing department says go until there's a boat that's on, you know, at a at a show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> sucks to be poor, right? <laughs> But what <laughs> you, you know them all. <laughs> You've heard them all. Um, yeah, I don't know. I remember the one you told me you dropped the boat out of the back of a plane one time. Oh, we did it more than once. <laughs> we did that all the time. <laughs> that that you actually can see it on YouTube now, but at the time it was yeah, at the time it was very highly classified. I was working, I was working for the Navy. Um, working for the Navy at the time, I was designing boats for, for the SEAL teams. And somebody got the idea, and actually the, the idea was before I got there, that it'd be you know, kind of cool to airdrop a boat out of the back of an airplane. Because, you know, an airplane can get you there a lot faster than a boat can. And then you can, you know, take the boat for the last few miles when, when you actually needed it. So we used to, you know, drop, um, you know, well, Boats up to 40 feet or 42 feet out of the back of, um, I, I've been on a couple C5s doing it, but normally it was a C141, uh, which I don't think they're around anymore. But anyway, you know, it's kind of a cool thing. <laughs> you know, you hope the chute opens, you hope the boat doesn't sink when it lands at the back. But, uh, you know, then all the seals jump in after and, you know, follow the boat down and get on, get on and go do, go do their thing. Um, but again, it, it, I, as I say, you can go go see it on YouTube now. Before you, I'd have to kill, kill you all, but that's, <laughs> that's not that's, that's long since gone. We, one, one one time we were, I'll tell you this. So one time we were out off. We used to very often go off um, Rudy Inlet, off Virginia Beach, and we would go just far enough offshore that no one could, from land could see it. it. Again, you know, we're trying trying to keep it quiet. So we go like you know 15 miles off and one time i was running one of the one of the safety boats for the for the drop and we, we get out to the landing zone and there's this you know grady white 25 or something fishing <laughs> <laughs> so we, we we had some you know fairly intimidating looking hardware so so we, we you know ran alongside this this grady white at about 30 knots and cut the throttle and the guy looks over us and he says we should get out of here, shouldn't we? <laughs> and we said, yeah, really quick. <laughs> so he, he took off and he probably, he actually probably, if he was looking up, he probably could see, could see the boats come out of the plane, but he, it was pretty far away at the time. But anyway. Um, okay. Well, I think I, I'm happy to stay and answer questions. Otherwise, our time is up. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it.